Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. Welcome Spartans to another Halo Book Club episode, part of Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. I am your host Aaron and with me today we have Oren. Hey everyone. This book club we are covering the Halo comic series Uprising. This is one I have never read before, so this was all new to me, and I learned some fun facts today that we will cover as we go along. We would like to take a minute to thank all of our patrons for your continued support. Thank you very much, guys. It never grows old to see another email come in that we have a new patron. Yes, thank you guys so much. If you would like to become one of our patrons, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Halo Podcast Evolved. If you go there, you can get details on all of the exclusive rewards that we offer, uh, early episodes, unique swag, access to our soundtrack, and the uh, patron-only Discord channel. All good things. And finally, uh, we encourage our listeners to support Audible. Uh, There you can enjoy, uh, enjoy a growing collection of Halo novels, all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, guided wellness programs, and much, much more. Use the URL audibletrial.com forward slash podcast evolved to learn more about starting your free trial today. Now, Oren, I'm going to hand over to you and you're going to take us through Uprising. Yes. So Halo Uprising, one of the early comics uh, in the Halo lore came out. There was a four issue comic that started in 2007 and had some kind of terrible delays and so uh so issue four didn't even come out till like spring of uh 20 or 2009 so it was uh, it was a long long road for this uh series but it's uh it was supposed to bridge the gap a little bit between halo 2 and halo 3 and so it was the intention for this to come out during the lead up to Halo 3's release in I think September of uh, 2007 and so kind of in that fall time frame uh, but after delays and delays for the for like issues 3 and 4 um, you know it took over a year for those issues to come out but to kind of uh, give us some housekeeping before we get into the events of the comic it was uh, written by Brian Michael Bendis uh, the cover art and the pencils and ink work were done by Alex Malieve. Then we have three colorists, Matt Hollingsworth, Jose Villarbia, uh, Villa Barua. I'm sorry, I'm missing, mispronouncing that likely Spanish name. Uh, and then uh, June Chung. And the lettering was done by Chris Aleppoas. I'm so glad you took these names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why you wanted me to do this this part, just to avoid the, the names. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always a burden to attempt to read individuals' names at times. But the uh, it was published by Marvel Comics, which I think also did the graphic novel. So, you know, Dark Horse traditionally, not traditionally, but uh, recently and more modernly have been doing uh, a lot of the publishing for the uh, comics. And uh, so these are the... The Marvel Comics sides of the uh, of the comic world. You can get both print and ebooks uh, editions of the of the whole collection. And uh, like I said, issue one was in August of 2007. Issue two was November of 2007. Issue three was a whole year later in August of 2008. And then issue four finally in April of 09. And shortly thereafter, in June, there was a hardcover collection for all four issues in one sort of package. And uh, and then kind of since then, we've had uh, re-releases with uh, the oversized collection in October of 2013. And very recently, in October or so in August of 2021, we had the Legacy collection, which also included some other of the uh, the old marvel slash you know uh bungee era comic pieces so is the legacy collection a dark horse then the legacy collection i believe is dark horse yes if you wanted to uh fact check that while i continue on but i believe it's uh i think it gives it kind of calls out marvel comics in the sense that they did the artwork but then i think the re-release was kind of packaged and done through Dark Horse. 
Um, it's about 160 pages, is about 40 pages per issue, and it follows a few events between Halo 2 and Halo 3, such as the UNSC's response to the Covenant invasion of Earth, and the Master Chief's endeavors while on board the Forerunner key ship Dreadnought. So we'll kind of break down each issue as it kind of jumps between those two main storylines with a few other tidbits tied in there. It uh, takes place over a two-week period between November 3rd, 2552 and November 17th, 2552. And we don't have exact dates per se, but we know that um, the Master Chief boarded the Dreadnought on the 3rd and then exited the Dreadnought on the 17th um, as kind of a, a way to... You know, that period between Halo 2 and Halo 3. And uh, we primarily are on Earth for one storyline in the United Republic of North America in Cleveland, as, and then we're on the ship, the Dreadnought, which is in the Sol system near like Jupiter and Mars and, and things like that. Uh, our characters in one story, we have Colonel James Ackerson, who we know from Fall of Reach and First Strike and some of those other lore pieces there. We learn that he has a brother, and so we follow him as long as a... Uh, a female singer artist, uh, Myris. And then we have the Master Chief in his story, and he uh, talks with some UNSC personnel that's on Jupiter's moon Io, as well as the Prophet of Truth and the Minister of Inquisition and things in that nature. So, let's dive in. So, issue one starts off with the Master Chief on the Dreadnought, and a lot of the Master Chief's sort of sections in this graphic novel is just him just like mercilessly killing all of the covenant that he sees and it's, it's pretty graphic i think um it's definitely a little bit more detailed gritty dirty like blood splashes on things dirt smudges and and just much more of that nitty and gritty uh than than like escalation if you were to compare the two so pretty much anytime you see chief he is he is just laying it down um and he's also being like covert because he's you know on the dreadnought trying to keep his uh impact down until you know the shooting there's starts. a lot of explosions <laughs> going on there i don't know how covert we can say he's been i love the scene where he blows a door up and it's just one full panel devoted to him standing at the top of these steps as an army of brutes and grunts come up and like the smoke's clearing and he just looks badass up in the distance there but almost every one of his panels here is either lit by explosions or gunfire <laughs> yeah the, they definitely needed some key lighting and so they they supplemented that with with ar fire and ex grenade explosions i was gonna say yeah like he's also the um I guess there's a there's a base on on the Jupiter's moon that's trying to hail him and be like Master Chief, what's going on? And he's like ignoring them and saying like radio silence and like trying to like I said trying to be covert. Meanwhile, he's literally blowing shit up. <laughs> so it's it's pretty comical. So we get some intense action sequences there. Then it cuts to Colonel Ackerson and he is uh, he looks pretty bad. He's also very bloody and gritty and uh, bound and being interrogated by a Bruce Chieftain on a battle cruiser near Mars that is on its way to Earth. And Ackerson is, you know, not giving any information and trying to, you know, protect humanity and all that. And just when the Brutes are like, well, you've, you know, your, your use to us has been kind of extinguished. We uh, will just kind of kill you now. He was like, oh, but wait, you know, there's this, there's this key on Earth, that uh, if you kill me, then you will never find it, and if you never find it, then the rings will malfunction just like they did thousands of years ago. Um, the brutes are like, what? Do we believe this this guy? And they're, you know, because the humans are known to lie a lot. And uh, and so basically they, they interrogate him more, and Ackerson says that there's this key, it's called the Keys of Azalon, and it's in Cleveland. So have fun finding Cleveland. How the Covenant or these brutes found Cleveland, I don't know. I'm not even sure where Cleveland is right now. I love that they call in in the panel. They're like, Cleveland. What is a cleave? Yeah, what is a cleave? <laughs> that, that is pretty good. 
so then what does it do? Now we jump to Cleveland and we see what's in there. We meet this new character who we learn is Ru- Ruan. And he is Colonel Ackerson's brother, which we don't technically learn until later, I think, in issue three. But he is a concierge for a Highline motel in Cleveland. And the motel is under attack by the Covenant. And he's kind of, like, down on his luck. And he's kind of thinking to himself, like, is it even worth, like, escaping now that the Covenant are here? And he seems just to be very gloomy and depressed. And then enters this, like this like badass like singer chick like you kind of learn more about her later on but her name's Myris and she just starts wrecking shit like she's like jumping around and she's like killing brutes and stuff and she's like also like having her own anguish and and like frustrations out on the world and being like ah this guy Philip left me and he ran away and he's supposed to protect me what am I doing with my life like you know, I, I want to be a singer, but I just, you know, pose nude for these magazines and, like, has all this this dark past. And so she's, like, a super troubled woman. It sounds very much, it, it sort of sounds like her backstory is she sold her soul to be a pop star when really she wanted to be, like, a, a quote-unquote real musician and, like, write her own music and do her own stuff. And, like, she didn't want to do music for kids and she didn't want to pose in all these outfits for photos and that wanker abandoned her. So she's just, like, having a bit of a bad time of it. <laughs> yeah, she's... But she's she's channeling, like, all of her anger, like, to a good cause by, like, killing all these freaking brutes and stuff. And so, anyway, during all the commotion at this hotel, the two of them meet. And so they kind of escape together into like this back alley and so they're talking they're like what's going on where are we going this and that and then they get actually intercepted by some jackals and then get escorted to like a stadium where everyone else in the area is being escorted to and they're like what's going on what do they want why why are we over here and and that kind of leaves us with the question of what's going on and then it cuts back to the master chief he's doing some more badass fighting but then a brute sidesteps him, knocks him over, and then, like, puts his foot on his chest and is like, tell me where the key of Ozalon is. Tell me, demon. And uh, and then that's where issue one kind of just ends. All in all, for issue one, like, it, it, I thought it was a pretty good setup for, for what's going on. You know, we kind of know what's going on a little bit with the key of Ozalon, but it seems that it's a lot of confusion of, of where it is and what it is. Um, and so far, Master Chief is just trying to stay alive. So far, I wasn't really feeling the uh, Earth storyline, I-, I will admit. I came around on it a bit more as we go on here, but I-, I wasn't feeling it at this stage. I wasn't, like, into it, into it, but I was I was still for it. It's like, all right, I'm, I'm always a fan of kind of civilians dealing with the Covenant because we-, we usually don't get that side of the story too often compared to the, the more militaristic side of things that we get in the... Uh, in the Halo novels and and other mediums. So I enjoy seeing a sort of less capable person, I suppose, deal with these types of issues. And it's another thing where, yeah, we know that the Covenant landed in multiple areas around around Earth. And uh, in Halo 3, we're in Kenya. You know, to see them drop in other parts of the world just kind of gives a little bit more context of, like, this giant invasion that happens on Earth. All right, well, just kind of continuing on from there, we we pick up right where we left off. The Master Chief is being interrogated by that brute on the ground, and basically the Chief kind of, like, toys with him a little bit, manages to, like, get a plasma grenade and, like, and, like, says some, some like, cheesy little one-line, whereas, like, you should you should make sure your, your prey have been disarmed, and then he chucks the plasma grenade, like, at the, at the brute's, like, balls and uh, like ducks away and then the brute like dies and then he just chief goes back to his sneaky ways but uh, manages to get out of that one I think we specifically need a medal in future halos called uprising if you can stick someone in the crotch that's that's oh that's awesome we should we should talk to uh, to Jeff Steiser and uh, have him say uprising and then let us talk to our connections at 343 and see can we pitch this as a thing we almost have a medal because there's a, there's the combat evolved medal where they where the guy goes combat evolved, like hey. So it'd be cool to get something in there. 
All right, let's see. So then we cut back to our Cleveland story. Uh, we get more of Myris's backstory, and she's kind of... I don't think she's, like, outwardly speaking any of these thoughts, but she's definitely internalizing a lot of this uh, among all the pandemonium that's going on in the uh, stadium. But, uh, but while everyone's in the stadium and all the Covenant are trying to seize control of it, a giant, like, ambush of uh, Marines and ODSTs show up and kind of liberate a lot of the people that are in the stadium. And so Ruan and uh, Miras uh, escape in, a, I think, a Warthog. And they just drive, you know, bat out of hell, shooting things. And uh, Myris kills, you know, more people or whatever, more aliens, and has some PTSD about it. Um, but uh, but they like get to a, like an abandoned little building. They they take a um, like a what's it? Not a torch. A um, like a roadside flare. They kind of light that. They create a fire. They have like a nice tender little moment. They change their dirty clothes into to like marine garb. And and do they do they kiss or is it or is it like an almost kiss? No, they do. They do actually kiss, and then they almost sleep together, and then it's like no. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, because the panels I don't think really had them had their lips touching, so I didn't know if it was insinuating that they were reserved or if it was just different, like a before and an after moment. I'm gonna hope they kissed. I think they kissed, but then a giant scarab comes in and kind of cocks block them, uh, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, what is going on?" That kind of ends that moment, but but that I will say that that was that scene and that sequence of them kind of talking, you know, didn't necessarily, I don't know, win me over, but it definitely was was a touching moment for the two of them, as uh, as we know, kind of how troubling it is when the Covenant invade planets and uh, what they need to do. We also get a little bit of more backstory with Ruan, and he starts talking about the key of Ozalon, and we get some hints as to what that is that he knows about it. Um, and that it's something that him and his brother talked about, but he kind of just left it there. He didn't really elaborate. Um, and then we quickly jump back to the Master Chief, where he is now covertly running around. He has a carbine rifle, and he sees the Prophet of Regret, or sorry, Prophet of Truth, in his, like, chambers with, like, his honor guard. And he, he, he reaches out to command at, at the Moon Io, says that he, you know, doesn't know what this Ozalon key is, but to catalog it, and, you know, he's going to try to assassinate the Prophet of Truth. And he fires, and then it, the panel the panel cuts the black, if you will. And that's our that's our issue two. So I, 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 I much preferred issue two. I think it kind of definitely picked up with uh, issue one and uh, kind of carried, carried things over a little bit more, a little bit more exciting, and, and the stakes are a little bit higher. Uh, issue three, it starts with a flashback, and this is where we learn that Ruan and James are siblings, and that they created the key of Ozalon, and that it was kind of this fictitious, uh, not not red herring. What's the? Let us be specific. They are big old nerds, and they invented this key. They are nerds, key. and all. But also, there are nerds, but they are in Halo canon. They are Tolkien nerds. J.R.R. Tolkien is 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 Halo canon, so the Lord of the Rings exists in the Halo universe. That's that's what that that's what that said. It's refreshing to see characters in the Halo universe not doing sci-fi things. It's kind of like <laughs> it wasn't something I was thinking of, and then I flicked across and was like, oh, they've got swords and helmets, and they're arguing over who's going to fight the dragon. Yeah, and who's going to kiss the princess. It's kind of funny because the correct brother ends up the same way as this fight where the brother that didn't want to kiss the princess ends up with the princess and the other brother ends up fighting the dragon. Yeah. No, that's a good way to look at it. But kind of building off of that, this key of Ozalon is something that they kind of invented and it's kind of like just a general MacGuffin that uh, that they used in their, their pretend playing as kids as uh, something that they needed to acquire to save the princess or whatever. Ruan is kind of just confused now that it cuts back to the present with uh, Miris, the, like why the Covenant knows about 
the key of Azalon and he's like, well, maybe it's just like a common thing, you know, like we didn't like event it, event it, like the words out there in the universe. And then Mira says, well, then maybe your maybe your brother told him about it as a way to, you know, say something or to protect you or something like that, um, which kind of got uh, Ruan thinking and eventually was says, hey, let's hop back in the Warthog. I want to take you somewhere. And so they go into this like underground base that I guess he just knew existed. <laughs> That's kind of where we leave that. And then we cut back to the Master Chief and he attempts to kill the Prophet of Truth but fails because the Prophet of Truth has a shield generator barrier thing over his hover chair and uh, he then has to escape. He's talking with the outpost on Io that he needs to escape and more shooting his way out and that sort of thing. And then there's another mo moment with Ruan and, and Myris when they actually reconnect with some UNSC Marines and they talk about this key and he basically says the key doesn't exist like we made it up and the Marines are like I have no idea what you're talking about and he's like I need to talk to like your superior officer like can you take me like you know I got a I got an idea I got a plan how we can fight back against the Covenant and um and they're like yeah sure okay I guess and so they hop in a pelican and they fly away and that's basically issue issue three it's uh, funny the scene where just before they meet up with the pelican he runs over some brutes, but in the close-up of where the brute decapitated head hits the bond of the warthog, it looks like a giant prophet head. It's got this weird shape to it in the next to stand, and it's like, it's like he decapitated a giant prophet of truth. I, I had to, like, double-check that. Like, obscenely large. It's, it's pretty funny. So then, issue four, our climactic finish... Um, it sees uh, Ruan, Miras, and those Marines. They go to that secret underground base and they talk with the kind of leading officers there and basically hatch this plan where they will infiltrate the Covenant ship or the Covenant cruiser to deliver this imaginary key. And they, kind of, they inject Ruan with this uh, serum called uh, Tycho's 30, which is like this liquid tracking device type of a thing that kind of lives in your body and then once he's on board they, they can track him to see where he is so they can fire a projectile at him so they can blow it all up um, so then you know knowing that this is kind of the end Ruan and Miros have a touching moment kind of says farewell they enjoyed their very brief time together but Miros is hopeful that she can have a new life that she wants to start anew and that's kind of where that leads. Then we cut to the Master Chief. He's continuing to escape, drives a ghost. He hears about, I think, IO stations kind of in contact with these Marines. So they are aware about uh, this pending uh, explosion that's going to happen. And now Master Chief is kind of getting closer to, to Earth. And so now he needs to start thinking of a way to get off the Dreadnought and kind of re uh, reconvene with the UNSC. Then we go back to um, Ruan, and he boards the ship, just kind of steps in the tractor beam, goes up, and he says, I am the key, everybody come to me, like I am the key, and, and everyone's kind of confused, and uh, this is Ruan kind of accepting that he can be the hero, and, uh, and, and hope that he's able to, to you know, save you know, someone or human not necessarily all of humanity, but just kind of do his part, if you will, and thanks kind of his brother for what he was doing. And so the uh, the Mac Cannon targets him because he's the tracker, blows up the ship, blows up Ruan. Also in this sort of issue, I'm not sure where exactly, we cut back to Ackerson, who is up on board the ship, and they basically realize that it was all for nothing. And, and the Brutes in sort of retaliation decapitate Colonel Ackerson. So both brothers end up dead. And this is the sad, the sad, uh, you know, valiant way that Colonel Ackerson dies after so much of, <laughs> of what he's gone through, both uh, deserved and not deserved over his career in the UNESC. Um, and then the issue closes out back at Master Chief, where he 
essentially just jumps off the dreadnought or drives a ghost off. And that's and then it leads into the opening scene of Halo 3 where we see a giant Master Chief spec fly towards the camera. And Cortana's talking to you about luck. It's not a bad story. No, it's not. It's it's we were kind of talking about this before. It's it's one of those stories that like, you know, something obviously happens, but like there's no overarching ramifications because it's it's pretty contained but i mean it's it's still an enjoyable story and uh and it gives gives you some insight on just kind of what goes what are some things that just go on on earth in these types of situations and that's kind of the biggest thing i took out of it i mean master chief on the dreadnought just kind of shooting people and or aliens uh, you know that you could almost just make like two <laughs> multiplayer levels out of it like that didn't really add anything uh i would say the story is more so about the um this this key of azalon and, and ruan with miras and kind of their attempts to just survive and uh what they had to do to do that or not do that but yeah this was my first time reading it as well like you mentioned at the top of the show aaron so i i it, it's a pleasant one i i think it's definitely worth a look because the art style is is so much different compared to the more modern halo comic book art so if you wanted to see halo through a different lens i'd, de- I'd definitely recommend you check it out for that reason um but uh it's it's a very easy read as well you could do this in a day and uh yeah that's kind of kind of my final thoughts on that Any, anything you want to add not overly it's this the art style is not bad i'd say it's more of a darker comic color wise for the most part than some of the others but like it's a good crisp clear art style you very rarely read a panel and go what the fuck is going on here like you can recognize everyone and see everything i came around on the story on the people on earth more to the end than i did at the start by issue two and three i was like okay this actually isn't that bad because otherwise yes like you said this would pretty much have been a four issue story of chief fighting his way off the dreadnought and that would have been it it could have been that story because the human earth part could be left out and it wouldn't really make any difference anyway but it is interesting to see how Ackerson bows out of the Halo universe because like you didn't I didn't know about this until I read it to see it and see how he like ends up kind of makes you rethink how nasty Cortana was to him in first strike yeah that's a fair fair uh, observation yeah she like she fucks him over she fuck him over in contact or in fall of reach and then i think she does something else to him well, later as we, well yeah well it happens i think once they're in orbit like i I, th- I think it happens more so in fall of reach than first strike but i don't think we really learn about it until i think until dr halsey's journal right yeah, and then we uh, we only hear from him again for Ghosts of Onyx. So that's really it. And then he gets shafted. Not that he's like he's not exactly the most warm, lovable character, but you also like being tortured by the Covenant seems a bit excessive. Yeah, no one no one wants that. And he, I mean, he stayed. I'd say he did his duty all the way up to the end. Uh-huh. Um you know keep keeping secrets and all that the bit i find the saddest is that um uh, at one point the characters on earth are talking about it and they're like oh maybe he did this to protect you because look the covenant aren't destroying cleveland like other cities and then the brother goes the only solution is to go up there and get blown up and you're like no you've died anyway (laughs) like if this was his final act that was it as it ruin ends up getting blown up anyway so that's kind of a thing yeah but you could also look at that you know they still saved you know mostly the population of Cleveland you know there were probably some casualties here and there but for the most part the city wasn't just annihilated there was still some hope in there I do love the UNSC's plan though because like in theory it makes sense you inject this guy with this tracking thing you're important they're going to take you to the prophet it's just a shame that the prophet was not on that ship 
Although it's probably for the best that they didn't take him to the Dreadnought because the Mac guns would probably not even have touched the Dreadnought. No, not at all. But overall, like, not a bad comic. Yeah, not bad at all. I, 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 if anyone has some spare Halo War lore they want to catch up on, Uprising is a is a good a good treat, a good afternoon read. And oh, just to drop it in here to confirm from earlier, uh, the new version is Dark Horse, and there's a, according to our good friend Amazon, the Legacy Collection is coming out on November thirtieth. The Halo Legacy Collection in paperback will be available November 30th of this year. Um, we have a little bit of trivia before we take it home. All of the covers for Uprising of all four issues show Master Chief on Earth, but in all four of the issues, he is still on board the Forerunner Dreadnought. So it's uh, kind of comical in that regard. And then for issue one, the Master Chief is de- t- depicted getting hit by six Hunter Fuel Rod Beams, which is likely an accurate depiction of the weapon strength. Uh, we know that you can not take that many off, uh, or not take that many hits, even in a super-powered shielded suit. And then uh, for issue three on the cover, the gravity hammer depicted is not emitting its characteristic blue glow. This could mean that at some point in the Master Chief's fight, the gravity hammer ran out of energy and perhaps the Master Chief was forced to continue using the hammer as a simple bludgeon as opposed to the actual gravity hammer, which I find interesting because that happens in the campaign. You'll run out of energy and you won't get the shockwave, but you can still whack people with it. Do you know, I would never think to whack people with a dead gravity hammer. I just chuck it and go for something else. (laughs) <laughs> it's a little bit more useful or I guess I guess for the sake of the game balance it's probably not much stronger than running out of energy on your energy sword because then if you keep you trying to use it you just punch people but at least with the hammer you have you know an item it would be nice if because there's a blade on the other side of it if you could just use it as a melee weapon spin it round when it's empty and just like smash the blade into people yeah just don't don't have a lunge or anything it just a very game of thrones just lodge it in the top of the enemy's head and then pull it out and move on there you go right well i think that about does it huh all right well i think yeah we can wrap up for another book club so guys thank you for joining us like we mentioned at the top of the show you can find all of our episodes over on the website that's halopodcastevolve.com it also features links to the discord server facebook group uh, patreon page xbox live club Uh, particularly go and join the club on xbox live because you'll be able to find other people from the podcast to play infinite with once again another special shout out to all of our patrons for supporting the show and helping to make everything possible head over to patreon.com forward slash halo podcast evolve to learn more and finally if you would like to leave us a voicemail about this episode or any other episodes um, or anything halo related for that matter you can give us a call at 205 evolved that's 205-386-5833 and with that I have been your host Aaron and until next time evolved evolved Evolve!